Hello and welcome back to Love Stream Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Srinath Ramkumar. And joining me today to host this episode is a new host, Adrian La Hoya. Thank you for uh, introducing me. And of course, we have an old host. Not that she's old, but uh, you know her words before. It's Alison Lewis. Hi, everyone. Very poor choice of words. I know. I just realized that after I said it. But anyway, now that we're here, let's move on. So in this episode, we're really trying to get into understanding what the other three roles in the steering group are. Have you guys heard about these section representatives? What comes to your mind when someone says section representative? Sounds very political. <laughs> Some sort of appointment. I'm not sure. Ali? Um... So I, I don't know, I feel a bit like I'm cheating because I am an external student rep. So I went to the general meeting and was there when they were elected. Um, but I'll, I'll try to be quick. So it's people who I think are elected to represent PhD students to the different sections within the Max Planck Society. So the biomedical section, the computing section, the humanities section. Correction, biomedical section, chemistry, physics and technology section, and the humanities section. Uh, it's not computing. But anyway, close enough. <laughs> so we're going to interview three section representatives in this episode. It's going to be Nikki van Teilingenbacker for the biomedical section uh, and Simon Hoffman for the humanities section and Sarah Young for the chemistry, physics and technology section. So without any further ado, let's get on with the discussion with the aforementioned three people now, shall we? We shall. Hi guys, welcome to Offspring Magazine, the podcast. Uh, we're very happy to have you here. So as a quick introduction, can you guys please uh, introduce yourself and tell us what you're doing? Let's uh, start with uh, Simon. Um, hi. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks. For, first of all, thanks for having us. Um, I'm uh, Simon, uh, Simon Hofmann. I'm part of the steering group uh, 2020 of PhDNet. And um, I'm actually... Uh, Doctor researcher in Leipzig at the MPI for Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences. But as part of the steering group, I'm the Human Sciences section representative. Great. Uh, Sarah? Yeah, hello. Thank you also from my side for having us. Um, I'm also part of this year's steering group, and I am the representative of the chemistry, physics, and technology section. And I work at the MPI for colloids and interfaces in Potsdam. Okay, and Nikki? Hi, thanks for having us on this interview. So uh, I'm Nikki von Teilingen-Bakker. I'm a PhD candidate at the Max Planck Institute for uh, Immunobiology and Epigenetics. And I am part of the steering group as the biomedical section representative. Okay, that's uh, really very short and crisp. Okay, so you guys are the three different section representatives of the PhD net. So... I want to ask questions in this direction just a little bit. So can you guys let me know what your exact responsibilities are? And please, you know, feel free to take turns and uh, discuss this because I want to know what the exact responsibilities are for each section and how they differ. So if I start, I think that there's not really very section-specific responsibilities. Um I think it's nice to be a section head because for me it was a bit of an easy start moving into the steering group without too much responsibility. Um, but what I've been working on this year is mainly organizing the general meeting, which definitely is there for all the sections. And um, I've also just recently actually started to get really interested in the onboarding process because I think there's a lot of interesting things there that could be changed and they actually need to be changed and that would really help um, PhDs. But again, this is, as I think, not that much uh, section 
specific. So kind of work for all, although we are the section representatives. Mm -hmm. Nikki? Yeah. So from my side, I can, I can give you two perspectives. One of them is really being the section representative, which allowed me to talk a little bit more specifically with some of the, um, the doctoral researchers in the section and, and really being the point of contact for them uh, if they have any problems during their, their PhD and their research. And then um, I can say that compared to a role like the deputy spokesperson, which was actually my role last year, um, being the section representative, as Sarah also mentioned, gives me a little bit more of an opportunity to work on specific projects. So in this case, uh, this particular year, I'm working on a project focusing on non-academic careers and uh, organizing a well, initially we wanted to organize a conference. This obviously was not going to happen uh, during this year. Um, but we switched, we pivoted to organize a web series and hopefully next year we can, we can organize the conference. So yeah, I would say more specific um, projects like Sarah also mentioned that really interest you. That's great to hear. And Simon? Um, yeah, I would I would agree. I think uh, our work as section representatives uh, within the steering group is not primarily governed by working for the section. But I think you definitely, or at least for me, it was uh, the case that I had a bit more, my antennas were uh, straight up for what's going on in the section and also what possible needs are there. Um, obviously, I don't have the chance to talk to every uh, PhD within the section, but, you know, when it comes to discussions, for example, what workshops could be there for career events, then, you know, then you're a little bit more, more aware and say like, hey, did you actually think about these people who um, re do research in law or so? And I mean, this is the, yeah, the responsibility you have as, I guess, section representative to to bring these ideas and thoughts and concepts in when they're necessary. Okay, that's cool. Um, if I could ask a question, you know, you all mentioned that you have a diverse array of responsibilities. I was kind of curious, you know, with this, with these kind of various responsibilities, how much time you end up actually committing to these tasks each week. If it's regular, if it's not, you know, give, just give us an idea. <laughs> then I will start again. Yeah, can, so we can mix up the order in the future. Yeah, no, it's good. I'm I'm happy to start. <laughs> um, so me, it's, for me, it's really irregular. I have to say. So in the beginning, um, of course, we have our weekly meetings as a steering group, and this is always the same. But in the beginning, it was not that much, I would say, because I just had to really kind of groove in to see what are the responsibilities. I, I mean, I was still kind of a young PhD when I started was uh, in my first year so I was still kind of getting used to this whole PhD net structure and all of this and um, now towards the end I actually am doing much more I would say at least every week I'm spending I would say half a day on things I mean you have to write emails here emails there and then I mean like overall I would say at least half a day per per week um and, but it's great because now you can actually see the impact of the work. And this is amazing. I mean, organizing the general meeting, it's not all coming together. It's being like, it's focusing and like, it's exciting. That's why you also want to spend the time. That makes sense. Uh, Nikki? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think just like Sarah mentioned, it, it varies. We have our weekly meeting. Um, every Friday morning at eight o'clock. Um, <laughs> let me put that out there. <laughs> so for all you early, early birds out there, I know. perhaps this may be a good choice, but for, for the night owls like me, maybe not so much. <laughs> I mean, it, it was a collective decision amongst the steering group. So every steering group has to decide for themselves, even though last year it was also at eight o'clock in the morning, but I think on a different day, I don't remember. Anyway, um, yeah, so... Uh, it really depends on the project that you work on and whether you take up new projects or, um, and also how much the working groups that you're kind of um, in charge of, you know, how much they can work autonomously, how much help they need with 
um, communication with the general administration. But generally, I agree with Sarah that it's a lot of emailing. Uh, that can sometimes take up a lot of time depending on, you know, what the specific project is you're working on. And otherwise, yeah, it's just a lot of communication with people, a lot of uh, Skype calls, phone calls that we're now more used to, I guess, uh, during this year. But yeah, it depends. Sometimes it can be a really busy week and sometimes it's less busy. Also for Sarah, I'm assuming that the closer to the general meeting it comes, the more, the busier it gets. So yeah, it really depends on the project. All right, Simon. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can agree again. I think it's, it depends on the phase uh, of the year, uh, depends on the project uh, you're working on. But I would say, I think in general, you, I think steering group is always in, in my head. Um, uh, there are these regular meetings every week. Um, there are we are actually in constant communication uh, through a telecom telegram channel, um, and obviously there's also a lot of these soft work I would call it. Uh, so when a name is dropped, uh, somebody working in the general administration, you will look this up. Who is that? Um, there's these little things you do on the side always. Um, so I think you're constantly in in the loop. Uh, I think you never lose the um, the connection or so to the work. Um, but there are times where you, there you do more for for it, and there are times where you have a bit of space also for your own research. Maybe if I can add one thing. So I found it actually quite difficult to somehow take vacation from steering group. Well. You know, when I take vacation from research, I take those days off, but then I'm still like, could use the time to do something for the steering group. So it's as always with this kind of work, it kind of draws you in and you just, it, it's really difficult sometimes to deconnect from it. But yeah, that's, that's also why it's so much fun, I would say. Yeah, actually, that raises a really good point is kind of how you balance your time commitments to steering group versus your other responsibilities in life. So like you mentioned, you know, you can take responsibility, you can take a vacation from your, uh, for your research projects, for example, walk away, but it's hard for you to walk away from the steering group. Just curious how you guys find balancing your time between uh, steering group and other things. If you just give a brief kind of idea of how, how you find that. Um, right. So again, I'm going to draw a parallel between last year and this year because they were very different in terms of the time allocation. Um, apart from the, the things that we mentioned, like the, the weekly meetings, the contact with the working groups and the, um, you know, the constant emailing and, and other phone calls that you might have with various people from the general administration or within the PhD net. Um, this year, not so much, but last year we did a lot of traveling. Um, so we had meetings perhaps with the working groups in person. We were invited to the general administration either to talk to the, um, the people working in the, uh, the HR department or, you know, present in front of the presidential circle, present in front of the, um, the section meetings. And this year, again, that hasn't happened so much. And so the traveling it's a different sort of dynamic, in my opinion, because now, let's say we take the general meeting as an example. We are going to have the general meeting for three days, right? Um, and it's all going to be virtual. That means that you will still be wherever you live. You are probably going to go to your institute to sneak in a couple of like cheeky experiments here and there. And so the dynamic is very different because otherwise you would have gone to the general meeting for three days in a different place, meet everyone. And so mm -hmm. that is a slightly different time allocation, I would say, from the usual. But otherwise, yeah, you are in the institute. You can do all your phone calls as, you know, I'm doing now. You can do all your phone calls at the institute if you want or at home, depending on, on how you allocate your time. And so that is slightly different. Yeah, I, I would totally agree that you kind of do many more things in parallel somehow at the moment. So it's, you know, you spend 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, you write a quick email, so things get very merged. But for me, I have a very, let's say, time-sensitive research project. So there's like weekly, like within the week, I have two big peaks where I like need to work a lot. And then it's kind mm -hmm. of dropping a bit. So I 
I'm kind of tending to go with that wave and uh, on my, so to say, free day, which is not a free day, but a less uh, work intense day, I tend to do more for the steering group because there I feel like I can really put my thoughts into it. While on the other days, I just need to like get things for, done for the research. And mm -hmm. it has been, has been working quite well for me. Um, I think overall, I would, I, I would agree. I think for me, it was hard to disconnect a little bit uh, during the beginning of the COVID time. I think this was for us, uh, yeah, I wouldn't call it exciting. It was quite a stressful time to really completely switch our plan for the year. Um, going into this virtual mode, also Nikki just described, and also really looking out what is happening currently at the Institute. Um, and this, yeah, was a constant, constant input and constant, yeah, also a form of pressure where, where we had to deal with um, But I, I think together we steered quite well through it. So it was also in that, in these terms, it was in a way also a bit exciting in a positive sense. Yeah. Sounds good. So I think you guys already mentioned that you guys have to do a lot of interaction with uh, people from the administration and, uh, you know, the GA in general. So the question is like, does it get a bit intimidating to interact with some high ranking people or? Do, or like are they accommodating of your interactions it's like do they listen to what you have to say and uh, do they feel that like do you kind of feel that the phd net is somehow being acknowledged by the ga in general okay. i think in terms of acknowledgement we can definitely say that we are acknowledged uh, in, in the ga um maybe nikki you can also say a bit if this changed from this year to the last year if you found a transition or it was very Very similar I don't know just I think it's quite interesting actually yeah so in my opinion I would say that um, initially of course it's it's always a little bit as any new situation it's always quite intimidating and especially because you don't know how these people are going to perceive you so I think starting in the steering group that is just the way it's going to be uh, <laughs> However, I am. I have to say that over the past two years, I've been very pleasantly surprised about how uh, seriously the PhD net is being taken, how valued our opinion and input is. Um, mm -hmm. It's a bit of a tight balance because sometimes you have to make sure that it's not used too much to the advantage. And I can explain that a little bit by saying... Um, You know, we are doing this voluntarily and we're not getting paid extra. We're not full-time employees from the general administration. So it's important to keep the balance and, and say, like, we are more than happy to give you input. We're more than happy to assist you with any projects, but we're not going to, you know, take over any jobs for the general administration. But uh, that being said, you know, the fact that we're getting invited to present the yearly survey results for the presidential circle and for the section meetings um, that we did that last year, that was, you know, a big vote of confidence from the general administration. And generally, you know, people we interact with who work on specific projects or who manage the department that we interact with a lot, uh, so Kerstin Dubnerji, she and, and the others in her department, they are very easy to work with and they take our work very seriously i would say i think i would i would also start in the beginning when when uh, we had our first meeting in in january in in munich with the um, headquarters and the people there i think i was very much surprised obviously also intimidated but also very much surprised how much actual respect and openness uh, we perceived um And I think I'm afterwards I was also a bit humbled because I realized that PhDNet and um, also um, all the efforts they put over the years, it really kind of, kind of resonates um, also in the headquarters. And this is something you definitely um, perceive when you come there and, and talk to the people. So I had actually no moment where I had the feeling that we were kind of the annoying flies uh, coming in every year, um, but rather that they want to have a, want to have a dialogue and, and respect our opinions. Um, yeah. That's, that's great. That's something I would like to add is that um, 
this is obviously an accumulative effort from all of the previous steering groups and not just, you know, last year and this year or this year. It's really like an, a continued effort um, that is being appreciated, which is nice. And maybe if I can add on on a bit of a critical side, um, I, found, I, thought, I felt it was really, really nice that we got the possibility to also talk to the president and uh, had a meeting with Kerstin Dupnagy, who is um, also a really important person at the GA. In these conversations, maybe if also because they were virtual this year, um, I felt that sometimes like really putting our points on the table was difficult and actually not just putting them out there, but getting somehow a real reaction. And um, I think this is some of the, yeah, one of the most critical point that I see is that they take the points, but then moving forward and changing things and really getting a reaction, this always takes a long time. Also, because it's just such a bureaucratic construct, it takes a long time. And I think this can also be a bit frustrating. And actually, I found this also quite intimidating at the beginning um, to push these huge boundaries and just like always poke again and again and again. I mean, but so you, you, guys, you guys kind of feel like it is important and necessary to sort of get involved with these organizational structures within the MPS so that you can, you know, also on a longer term, so you can actually bring about some real changes to the working conditions of PhDs, right? So that kind of uh, leaves me into the next question, which is, uh, so you guys set a certain number of goals at the beginning of every year. There's a certain agenda that you guys want to fulfill. So broadly speaking, what kind of goals were you aiming to fulfill by this year? And also how much of them got derailed because of COVID? And uh, please uh, take it away. Perhaps you can start with Nikki this time. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a very good question. I think this year my goal for joining the steering group was really to work on a specific project, which I indeed started working on. And like I mentioned before, um, so I, I decided to focus on highlighting non-academic careers for doctoral researchers within the Max Planck Society. And the idea initially was to organize a conference, which obviously got derailed for uh, because of COVID. Uh, however, we quickly uh, changed things around in order to be able to um, organize a web series instead of the in-person meeting. And hopefully in the future we can still... Um, organize the in-person meeting for general phd net work i would say that um all of the all of the in-person meetings that we would have had either with the working groups or with each other which is a topic that we can discuss later because i think it, it really it makes for an interesting dynamic um that i think we've more or less recently figured out within the steering group but yeah, the, the in-person meetings and the meetings at the general administrations are um, all virtual, which it changes the dynamic, as, as Sarah also mentioned before. Um, I think there are some pros and cons to it, but yeah, generally those were... It didn't change the overall thing, but it changed the dynamic within the meetings and perhaps like the points you can get across. Mm -hmm. Also, with the limitations of uh, having to discuss virtually, where you know there is always a little bit of a gap between uh, a person speaking and a person actually listening to it, which is not there if you're in the same room. So I kind of yeah. feel like even this might help you sort of not make a certain point which you would have wanted to have made if you were in a in a room having discussion anyway. Uh, okay, so Zimon, you have anything to add to this? Um, I think, I think um, in comparison to Nikki, I think for everybody, I mean, Nikki did, did the steering group the last year uh, already. Um, I think for me as coming uh, yeah, new into um, the steering group, I think first of all, you're kind of intimidated by, by what's going on. Like, first of all, you need to understand like the whole structure, not just of PhDNet, but also of, of the Max Planck Society. 
And I think for me, there were a lot of topics where I said they are interesting for me. Um, um, for example, I also wanted to facilitate uh, communication with the sustainability network because I think it's it's quite an important topic. Um, but over the over the time, I also realized, hey, they're doing actually quite a good work, and I think the, the work we do at PhD Nets um, is really more specific to to PhDs, and um, I think the sustainability network is doing something which. I think is important for everybody in the Max Planck society and beyond. So I think there are these things you, you realize over the time and then you groove in basically in, into some topics and, and um, some projects you work on. Um, I think um, overall um, we also set um, us like very specific key points for this year. So the steering group, had like these three major key points, uh, working on the working conditions, uh, working on career development and communication um, within PhDNet, but also beyond. And I think when I first saw this list, I was quite intimidated. I thought, oh my God, we are not going to uh, tackle all these points. Um, but I became quite surprised how much we pushed actually each of these also sub uh, points um, within these uh, big headlines we have um, or these big key points we have um, yeah and so yeah yeah I would totally agree with uh, Simon's experience um, I was very intimidated when I started but at the same time also super excited to actually go for these big topics especially for the working condition topics i would say so like the contract length and the payment and all of this and i would say it was all a bit uh, shaken when the corona situation arrived and actually i think for some of our points this quite helped um because it kind of showed even more clearly where the bad apples are sitting. I would put this uh, in that way. <laughs> um, but it, for me, it was actually, as Simon already said, it was really nice to see how by taking many little sub points, we actually pushed things a lot. And I think we, we do have an impact um, on every PhD's no kind of normal life, so to say, in a way that they don't see it. But by doing mm -hmm. these many little things um, with the GA, um, this this actually changes the, the overall process. And I think this is something really important to keep in mind mm -hmm. for the for the whole okay. work. Mm. Can I can I add something to this? Sure. Because apart from apart from projects having to pivot. Um, in order to still happen, so like the general administer, uh, the general meeting. Sorry, the general meeting uh, had to go virtual. Career evolution had to go virtual. Um, these kinds of projects, they they had to change in the way that they were uh, they were organized. However, we also took, like Sarah uh, alluded to a little bit, we took this situation and and kind of flipped it to our advantage because actually um the topic of communication we weren't quite sure how to tackle it and the covid situation really made it so that we had to engage more on social media we had to engage the phd net more in virtual meetings um and and spread information more efficiently and i think i'm really impressed by how phd net as a whole but especially this my colleagues in the steering group how they they flipped everything around and, and just pushed that through. I guess, you know, because the last question was regarding, you know, what goals you had set at the beginning of the year, thinking back now on the year with you know, the situation that we're in, I was wondering you know, what you would think of the current state of PhD net with regards to, you know, the objectives that you had early on um, and how, how, you know, how much you feel you've accomplished them, what challenges you faced there and kind of your outlook on the future for that. I think we mentioned this before that we, I think we, I can speak for us all that we all feel like we actually accomplished many small things and 
this mm-hmm. might sound a bit negative, but it's not meant at all in a negative way. It means that many, many, many drops are needed um, to form the ocean, to be poetic here. <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it's, it's very poetic. It, we, we also had a time when we actually went back and looked at all the things that we had already accomplished. And it was great to see because I think we all felt like not really a big thing had been pushed. But then we looked back and we all saw that um, that there were these many, many, many steps that we already took. And, and this was really rewarding. But overall, I think, um, you know, new, new problems come, old problems stay. So I don't think any future steering group will have a boring time. I think there's always things to make better, mm-hmm. um, always problems mm-hmm. that just need to be there and need to be mentioned and again and again. I just wanted to sort of uh, follow up on this because you mentioned that because when a new PhD or a new steering group comes in, they will still have some of the problems that the old PhD uh, net steering group was facing. So is that so? Is there like a certain issue that because of this high turnover rate of the steering group, do you think there are some system systemic issues which are more hard to address, or does it sort of does it help if there are people sort of continuing from one steering group to the next, or a certain new way to onboard new steering group members, which would sort of ease this process or try to you know get off you know start off where you left off sort of instead of starting from the ground again. Yeah, so I I can start by answering this question again from the perspective of having continued uh, a second year in the steering group. It's easier. You know, you start from a very different point um, the second year. And um, I also noticed that the the general administration, they like, uh, you know, they like stability and they, they like it when they see the same face and they know that they can, that who you are, that they can talk to you and what kind of topics um, you know about and that they can talk to you about. So that, that is definitely something I mentioned and many, many, many people in the general administration in our first um, meeting of the year there, they mentioned the same thing like, oh, it's really good that someone is continuing to you know, to bring things forward. So on the one hand, yes, I would say it's definitely easier. However, I would also like to add that the diversity that comes from the steering group, especially when it when it's about, you know, um, international students versus European students versus German mm-hmm. students, um, I think this brings a very important perspective and that is what I what I noticed for instance last year is that there was a heavy emphasis on uh, this international aspect let's say simply because four four members of the steering group were actually international whereas um you know and and even being international Lindsay has a very different perspective compared to the perspective that I have so in that regard, I really think that the diversity in the steering group will also bring up new issues and new perspectives that, that can push things forward. So there's pros and cons. I wanted to add something to what Nikki said. And for me, it was really helpful to already have people there in, like who already did the job before. And I felt very warmly welcomed by the GA and trusted just because they already knew Nikki and Lindsay and they had built trust with them. And so this kind of distrust was kind of spread amongst all of us. At least that's what it felt like. So I found this very useful, but I can also see what, uh, see Nikki's point in saying that um, there's a different dynamic. And I think with new people coming in, there's also a new energy because this work is taking a lot from you and I feel like you need new people and new energy every year to keep it running so I think if the term was two years this this was this would be too much and it's actually nice that this year we had this continuation but still this new energy yeah maybe I can add that um I think we are very much aware that this is the case. So we have this tr- structure of having every year a new steering group. Um, and this obviously comes with some, let's say, challenges. 
But uh, since we are aware, I think there are also, it is clear that uh, people from the old steering group will be available to talk to. I think it's rarely that they just disappear and you, you never hear back from them or so. So um, I think we still have a quite good connection to former steering group um, members. And I think we are also aware when we leave the steering group at a certain point that we also will be always there for, for the next steering groups. Um, and yeah, I think there's also this aspect which was brought up already. Um, I think every member brings something new, but I think there's also a different perspective. So for example, my work in the steering group was also accompanied by me talking to, um, colleagues in my institute about PhD nets, about what work we do and so on. So I think there are people around me who don't necessarily directly have to do with PhD nets or, or our work, but they know about it now because I talk to them. And I think there's also a big value having new people at the steering group who talk again then to their peers uh, about their work. So this is also a form of information propagation through the PhD nets or the network of all PhDs, which has also a value. Um, so I, I wouldn't just see it critical. Um, so I had a question I wanted to ask about if you could imagine that there are new steering group members that are going back and listening to this podcast, is there one, like, could you each give one piece of advice to say a new member who's trying to kind of wrap their head around their new responsibilities and what they should be doing? Imagine that you are that new, like think back to when you were that new member, what would you have wanted to hear? <laughs> I, I would tell the person, talk talk to as many people as you can in the beginning and don't get too stressed about pushing one specific thing that you had on your agenda in the beginning. But like you have one year, which is a lot, and you will achieve many things. And sometimes it will be difficult and sometimes it will be much easier than you think. But like talk to many people, get a perspective and you'll be fine. That's great. Nikki? Yeah, um, I'm trying to think, like, <laughs> what advice did I give you guys when you just started? I don't, I don't know. Um, I, think, I think the most important thing is to not stress. And, and like Sarah said, to really um, set up the right connections from the start. So, again, as an example, in the first year, I was, I was very much involved in open science. So we involved MPDL. We had the working group for open science. And as soon as that is kind of off and running and you involve many people who can work on, on the project or different projects um, and you then are in charge of the communication with the general administration, from there, it, once the ball is rolling, it will keep rolling one way or another. And of course, you need to be a little bit flexible, as, as we've seen this year, to uh, change your strategy and and you know employ different tactics. But in the end, everything will be okay. <laughs> it's very reassuring. <laughs> um, yeah, from my side, I would say there there's definitely a very concrete uh, advice, um, which I think was for us. Uh, we, we had a comfortable start since there was, uh, as we talked before about it, there were already two people, Nikki and Lindsay, who were already in the steering group. But my advice would be to get all the, let's say, organizational structure of your steering group, uh, put this very much or fast in place. So decide for a communication channel. I know, decide for a regular meeting uh, when you do that. Um, so because I, I experienced that in other other groups I worked in that there's sometimes a lot of time wasted uh, just to set up which, which on which channel you're communicating or so. I think if this is set up and you have a kind of a good structure where you can work in um, and then you can start also yeah, literally enjoy it, um, get to know the people, don't stress about it. Um, um, yeah, and set some goals and... And I think working on these goals is it's um, yeah quite more fun if you, if you do that in in a in an organized structure um, yeah and on a more let's say uh, encouraging side I would say yeah I would I would say the same I mean uh, as 
um, I think Sarah and also Nikki said before, um, yeah, you can you can look ahead to a great time and also great experiences. Um, and I think this really helps also to go through sometimes uh, maybe overwhelming <laughs> situations or so. Yeah. Any problems that PhDs have, and also we have them within the different sections. And perhaps you could sort of highlight some of these problems that the like a future steering group may have to focus on. And uh, just, you know, I'm going to add a few questions to this, so please uh, hold your breath uh, or don't. Uh, there are some organization structures which are in place in each section. And is there like a way that other sections could benefit based on this? And are there different transferable solutions between different sections? And is there a need for more or less crosstalk between sections? Those are a perhaps, lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> perhaps Simon can start this one. I mean, you can always comment just on the parts that you feel matter most to you. Yeah, I I think that's uh, I think it's a it's a good, very good and valid question. But I I think I could talk a lot about it. Um, um, I try to to be dense. Um, I think. There is something to it to have this uh, split into sections within the Max Planck Society. Um, but there is, especially, for example, in the human sciences section, there's such a variety of institutes and um, research disciplines. Um, so it's really hard sometimes yeah, for us to really get the concept of these sections. Um, so it feels, to a certain degree, also arbitrary, this division. Um, I think it's in PhD net overall, our goal is always to um, yeah, accommodate for the needs of all the PhDs in the society. But as I said before, I mean, there are certainly, um, for example, some disciplines in the, for example, human sciences section, which are very specific. Um, some, uh, yeah. the example was um, like in career development, there are certain skills you maybe want to learn uh, for your future career also maybe outside of academia. Um, but um, I think we do the crosstalk already. So I think especially in PhD nets, um, we rarely split the society or the network in these sections. So um, in, in that sense, um, I think that's already there, um, the communication and the crosstalk and the learning from each other. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that in, in the Max Planck Society, there's a, like Simon mentioned, uh, there's a reason for the sections. Um, one thing that I would say that people can learn from the biomedical section, uh, which I've noticed also when we presented the survey results in front of the presidential circle, is to implement a TAC. Um, this is widely implemented throughout the biomedical section, and it's not so, I mean, to be honest, the vice presidents didn't even know what attack was, what it was about, why it was there um, in the other sections compared to the biomedical section. So this is one thing. And I think that PhDNet, by having this crosstalk between the sections, um, can really efficiently kind of pinpoint these sort of issues. Another um, Plus, in the biomedical section is actually the, um, the gender balance. I don't know if that's a natural thing, that it just happened to be that way. Um, this, we can see across the sections, um, is not necessarily uh, equal. However, I would say that in, that in that regard, what we can learn from the CPT section as biomedical section and as the humanities section or the human sciences section, sorry, um, is... Higher salaries. Mm -hmm. Completely agree with you on that point. <laughs> uh, Sarah? Yeah, so actually, Nikki, you just stole my two favorite points. <laughs> Not stole, but I think the CPT section is a bit the old men's club, to put it um, mm -hmm. badly, maybe. Um, oh. As you can see in PhDNet, we're not having that problem because there is a 
young woman representing the section. So, <laughs> um, talk on but, your name. Yes, <laughs> um, but um, I I feel that this is really a big issue for the CPT section, and we really need to face this problem that that there is no gender balance there, um, and this. This is something that is not so often talked about because um, it's it's also a difficult and lengthy process. But I think we really need to work on this and it will change communication and we need to really learn from the other sections there. Um, well, I mean, the CPT, as Nikki already mentioned, is normally quite well paid so this is not such a big issue for our section um while there are actually still differences within the section so but this gender thing is i think one of the major cbt things that we need to focus um and this comes with a lot of more soft factors of communication and having good tax and um i feel like a female influence especially also amongst the directors within the CBT would help a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's great to hear. And uh, I think with that, we've come to the end of uh, all the hard-hitting questions that we wanted to ask you. And uh, I hope you guys were, you know, felt comfortable. You guys can relax now. It's, uh, it's fine. <laughs> to, there is no pressure. It's just a podcast. So... I really want to thank you all for taking time out and doing this. And it was really, really nice so that we can understand what each section representative does and what the different problems you face and from your perspective as the section representatives as well. I think that's pretty, pretty, pretty good. And uh, let's hope for all the listeners who are listening to this episode that if you want to apply for a position of a section representative during the general meeting this year, please feel free to catch up with any of them with Nikki, Sarah and Simon and I'm very sure they're very happy to help you out and have a discussion with you about their roles anyway so uh, with that thanks a lot guys thanks a lot for joining us and we was very happy to have you here thanks a lot Adrian for doing this interview with me I think it's your first episode as uh, Offspring Podcast's new host it is yes <laughs> and uh, also a shout out to Nikki's new podcast called Career Navigators and where she's going to talk about uh, people who've take, taken on non-academic careers throughout. And she's going to talk a lot of them. So we'll put a link to all of these in the de description down below. And if you guys didn't know already, I think I mentioned this in the previous episode, the general meeting is from November 4th to 6th. So feel free to tune in. And uh, Maybe Sarah? I can add something for the general meeting. So since I'm organizing this, we will have really interesting guests we have a lot of people from the ga we have the vice presidents we have the section heads there's there will be a lot of opportunity to communicate to these people and also to really get to know the working group so please join take the time it will be a great event where you can learn a lot and where we where we where we will be able to address many important things so please take the time and join okay very well said. Thanks a lot, guys, and uh, hope to see you all very soon during the general meeting. Thanks for the great interview. Wow. Yes. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for having us. Okay. Well, that was an interesting discussion, now, wasn't it? What do you think, Adrian? Well, I definitely learned a lot about the, the role that different steering groups play within the PhD net and you know how to get involved, what kind of tasks you kind of have to do and yeah. what kind of goals you can accomplish. So I think it was really interesting. That's pretty cool. So by the way, if you guys were wondering, where was Ellie? She, she was there at the intro, then she vanished. That's because she couldn't be with us during the interview because she was busy. But now she's back for the outro. Hi, Ellie. Hi, everyone. <laughs> it's the most important part, intro and outro. <laughs> wouldn't miss it yeah so ali so you've thought about the you mean you were there at the general meeting last year yeah and you voted probably for the biomedical section representative because you're the external representative for the biomedical sec one of the institutes in the biomedical section right yeah so what made you want to vote for this person and how like what what were the convincing arguments for you 
Oh, you're really testing me going back a year ago voting? Um, I mean, I think one thing that stands out about Nikki is that she's very, clearly very driven and dedicated to what she does and shows a lot of passion. And mm -hmm. she articulates that passion really, really well. And so I think that, you know, we already have so much work in our PhDs. And so to do a job like this, like if you have passion, it's going to make it mm -hmm. feel yeah. just a bit easier. Yeah, it's true. Definitely true. So would any of you guys consider running for one of these section representative roles? I don't think I can now that I'm so committed to the Offspring podcast. <laughs> well, very well articulated. I appreciate the passion. What Thank about you, you Ali? I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to horrify Adrian saying this, but uh, yeah, I mean, when we were there last year, like I did think this sounds really, really interesting and like I could learn a lot and, and see what this is like. But in a sense, I also do agree with Adrian that I've been doing the podcast now and, you know, I, I don't want to split myself too many ways because then, you know, you can't really accomplish anything. Exactly. Very well said. And I think we're really looking for dedicated members and people who really have this passion to represent the PhD students of their section at the steering group level. So anyway, the elections of all the members of the steering group are going to be happening at the general meeting, which is from November 4th to November 6th of this year. So stay tuned for that. And until then, I bid you adieu. And so does the other two Ciao. co hosts. <laughs> bye, everyone. Ourselves. It's okay. <laughs> All right. Bye bye. Bye. Offstream Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD and the science communication working group known as the Offstream Magazine. The podcast series is hosted by Srinath Ramkumar, Nikolai Herman, Alison Lewis, Adrian La Hoya, and Sandra Fendel. The intro outro music is composed by Srinath Ramkumar and the pre intro jingles composed by Gustavo Carrizzo. Please feel free to write to us with any feedback, comments, or suggestions at offspring.podcasts at phnet.mpg.de. Until next week, I'll see you then. Bye-bye, stay safe, stay strong, and stay healthy. Wow. Wow. Wow.